Okay, we back in Brooklyn. Today we are going back when guys were getting a lot of money in the streets. By the late 1980s, these men had formed a gang for which they adopted the name The Poison Clan. They may have been named after a martial arts movie, Five Deadly Venoms, and originated among Jamaicans and other West Indians in Brooklyn. George Chang, Smiles, Sean, Winston and John were the earliest members of the crew, with George Chang leading the pack. George Chang, who also went by the name Stretch, was of Jamaican and Chinese descent and also the youngest out of the crew. Some members were older than him by 10 years plus. Under Stretch's leadership, the Poison Clan sold large amounts of crack cocaine in the Brooklyn area, specifically, Church and Troy Avenues. Word on the streets, Stretch once got into an altercation at the famous Apollo with Harlem's own Alpo Martinez after Alpo touched his chain. Stretch is alleged to have slapped Alpo before going to his whip to retrieve the Mac and shooting at him. It was not reported and not clear if Alpo was ever hit, just the word on the street. Poison Clan member, Smiles, had a brother named Big Bull. Big Bull had a military background, and around 1988, he would join his brother Smiles in the drug game. Beginning in July of 1988, Smiles took workers from Brooklyn to assist him in the distribution of crack in Richmond, Virginia. According to the evidence, the Richmond drug operation was originally set up at a Bow Street apartment by Smiles, Oliver Wiltshire, Delroy, Sherman, Miller, Andrew, and Terry. Delroy and Miller were cousins, and Wiltshire was allegedly a brother-in-law to Smiles. Wiltshire and Sherman were primarily responsible for transporting the drugs from New York to Richmond. Smiles, who was the source of the drugs, cooked powder cocaine into crack. Other members, primarily Sherman and Terry, sold the crack from the Bow Street location. Delroy's role was to collect the money from Bow Street and make sure that enough drugs were on hand at the location. The money collected was turned over to Smiles, who paid the New York suppliers and generally ran the operation. After the Bow Street apartment was set up, an additional apartment at Tifton Court was rented to serve as a safe house for Smiles, Delroy, Miller, and Wiltshire. Sherman and Terry, described as workers, continued to live in and sell drugs from the Bow Street apartment. At trial, Delroy confirmed that this was all true. With most of the stories dealing with drugs and money, there is murder involved, so let's get to that. By November 1988, Miller had become dissatisfied with the amount of money he was receiving for his efforts in the drug operation. Smiles' attempts to placate Miller led to arguments and eventually Miller, Sherman, and Delroy began making plans to leave Smiles' organization. Smiles, however, began to suspect the others' plans to strike out on their own and, at about the same time, brought his associate, Claude Dennis, to Richmond. On December 3, 1988, Smiles and Dennis went to the Bow Street apartment to find Sherman and Miller. Unable to find them, Smiles and Dennis returned to the Tifton Court apartment to wait. Wiltshire, Smiles' brother-in-law, was home at the time. As it turns out, Sherman, Miller, and Delroy had been checking out locations in Norfolk to start their own drug distribution spot. Delroy's girlfriend was with Delroy, Miller, and Sherman that evening. She would later confirm this to be true and that Sherman also planned to leave the Richmond operation, although there was some testimony that he, unlike Miller and Delroy, may have planned to return to New York and leave the business altogether. In any event, Sherman and Miller returned to Tifton Court at approximately 11.30 p.m., encountering Smiles and Dennis. Delroy arrived at the apartment minutes thereafter. At some point, Sherman went into the kitchen to call his girlfriend in New York, and Wiltshire went upstairs, where he joined Delroy's girlfriend. Smiles, who was still in the living room, demanded that Miller explain where the three men had been. However, the ensuing argument between Smiles and Miller escalated into the shootings of Delroy, Miller, and Sherman. According to the testimony, Smiles took Miller's 32 caliber Derringer handgun during the argument and refused to give it back to Miller. Miller said something to the extent of, this is my apartment, my gun, and I paid for it with my license. When the two began scuffling, Delroy tried to break them up. Dennis pointed a 38 caliber handgun at Delroy's head and told him, don't think about it. Eventually, Smiles pushed Miller into the living room of the apartment. Miller, who was not aware that Dennis had a gun, turned his back to Smiles, removed his jacket, and formally challenged Smiles to a fight. At that point, Smiles nodded to Dennis and went into the kitchen where Sherman had gone to call his girlfriend. Dennis then pulled out his gun and fired a shot at Miller, which sailed a couple of inches over Miller's head. 
joke. When Miller realized that he was being fired upon, he turned around, only to be shot in the heart and killed by Dennis's next bullet. Delroy, upon seeing his cousin Miller shot, jumped to Miller's aid to prevent him from falling. Dennis then fired a shot at Delroy, which struck Delroy next to the heart, and the bullet came through in the center of his back. Delroy played dead for a time, but managed to retrieve his 9mm from the back of his pants. He got up on his knees and looked out the front door. He saw Dennis, Smiles, and Wiltshire. Dennis, however, saw that Delroy was alive, and the two men began to extrage gunfire, until Delroy shot Dennis on the staircase, where Dennis dropped the 38 caliber handgun. Dennis then ran upstairs, where he encountered Wiltshire and Delroy's girlfriend, and began to crawl out of the upstairs window. Wiltshire ran down the stairs and out of the apartment, where he saw Smiles and Dennis leaving in Smiles' car. Delroy also left the apartment and headed towards a nearby convenience store, dropping his 9mm handgun along the way. In response to calls about the shootings at Tifton Court and of a shooting victim at a nearby convenience store, police officers were dispatched to the area. Upon their arrival, they found Miller lying dead in the living room and Sherman lying dead in the kitchen. Miller had been shot once in the chest with a 38 caliber revolver, and Sherman had been shot twice with a 32 caliber Derringer, once in the chest and once in the back. The third victim, Delroy, was found alive at the convenience store and transported to the hospital. The 38 caliber revolver was found on the steps in the Tifton Court apartment, and the 32 caliber Derringer was found in the front yard. Six 9mm shell casings were also recovered. In a safe in the upstairs bedroom, officers found a Tupperware container of clear plastic bags containing crack cocaine and an envelope containing powder cocaine. Several days later, police located an additional hidden compartment at the bottom of the safe, which contained $1,000 in currency. After the Tifton court shootings, Smiles returned to New York. According to the testimony of Poison Clan member, Winston Gordon, Smiles admitted that he shot Sherman and said that Dennis shot Miller. Similarly, Dennis told Andrew that he shot Delroy and Miller and that Smiles shot Sherman. Over time, dissension grew within the ranks of the Poison Clan. On New Year's Day, 1989, Stretch, the youngest in charge, was murdered. After Stretch's death, the Poison Clan broke into two factions. Smiles would continue bumping drugs in Richmond, Virginia, while Sean, John and Winston would base themselves in Boston. The Boston-based Poison Clan operation distributed crack cocaine procured by Sean and sold by local youths. The operation was lucrative, bringing in about $10,000 a day. By February of 1989, Smiles' brother, Big Bull, plotted with co-conspirators, Charles and Charles, aka Tookie, to avenge the murder of Poison Clan founder and leader, Stretch, by killing those who participated in Stretch's murder. Meanwhile, Smiles was dealing with issues in Virginia. In early 1989, Poison Clan member, Tracy Lavake, transferred from the New York operation to the Richmond operation and began selling drugs at a Rose Avenue. By October of 1989, however, Lavake began talking to Smiles about leaving the organization and going out on his own. On the evening of October 9, 1989, Smiles led Lavake into an alley behind the distribution spot to talk. Instead, Smiles shot Lavake twice, once in the arm and once in the chest. This attracted the attention of Dennis, Heston Benjamin, and James Phillips to the alley. Dennis and Benjamin put Lavake in the trunk of Smiles' automobile, and they, along with Smiles, dumped Lavake's body in a wooded location. Although left for dead, Lavake managed to drag himself to a highway and lived to name his assailants. On December 20, 1989, Sean, who was leading the Boston faction of the Poison Clan, and another man, Robert Dudley, was found dead in Queens. It was alleged that Sean was responsible for the death of Stretch, the said original leader. With Sean gone, the Boston arm of the Poison Clan lost its supplier and was forced to shut down. In 1990, John and Gordon returned to New York. Later that year, without John's knowledge, Gordon returned to Boston to begin his own operation selling marijuana. Things transpired on their end, but we are not covering that in this video. Sometime in 1990, Big Bull became the co-leader with his brother Smiles in the Poison Clan. According to the indictment, it was said that on or about October 22, 1990, in Virginia Beach, Virginia and elsewhere, Bull assisted in the armed abduction of two men and a murder. There was also some alleged witness tampering. Sometime in 1993, Smiles sent Bull to Richmond to handle the crack distribution business there. 
Colin Joseph, whom Smiles had earlier sent to Richmond to sell crack, eventually began to operate as Bull's right-hand man. Closely associated with these men were three others, Peter Paul, Spooky and Jimmy Fingers. Spooky and Jimmy Fingers both had reputations ranging from guns and drugs, and both had been getting money in New Jersey. Spooky had also been sent to Richmond to sell drugs there for the Poison Clan, and had once shot a guy twice in the leg at close range. Spooky was eventually supplied drugs by Peter Paul and Jimmy Fingers. Joseph, Paul, Jimmy Fingers and Spooky were all distributing crack for Bull, from the Bellamy Departments in Richmond. By the end of 1993, the organization's Richmond operations, where shifts of dealers sold crack 24 hours a day, generated as much as $80,000 per week. At the same time, the organization was making weekly deliveries of crack to Albany and Baltimore, while it looked for still other opportunities to expand. On January 12, 1994, Anthony Baylor, his nephew Marco Baylor, and Anthony Merritt were shot and killed in the Sugar Bottom area of Richmond. A fourth victim, Charles Meekins, was also shot and severely wounded. Colin Joseph provided testimony concerning the drug operation at the time and the Sugar Bottom murders. Specifically, Joseph testified that, during a trip to New York shortly before the Sugar Bottom murders, Smiles and Big Bull discussed expanding the Richmond operation into the Sugar Bottom area of Richmond. Anthony Baylor sold marijuana from an apartment in Sugar Bottom, a place frequented by Spooky, Jimmy Fingers, and the others, and Big Bull wanted to sell crack cocaine at the same spot. When Baylor refused Big Bull's invitation to sell crack for the Smiles organization, Big Bull and his associates hatched a plan to rob Baylor and take over the spot. On January 12, they set the plan in motion. Peter Paul drove Joseph, Jimmy Fingers, and Spooky to Baylor's Sugar Bottom apartment. Anthony Merritt answered the door, and Joseph and Jimmy Fingers entered the apartment. Jimmy Fingers put a gun to Anthony Baylor's head and demanded money and weed, and Joseph locked the door. Anthony Baylor and Marco Baylor were seated. Charles Meekins was asleep on the couch. At that point, Spooky knocked on the door and Joseph let him in. Joseph gave his 41 caliber revolver to Spooky, began searching the apartment, and took marijuana, guns, cash, and jewelry. Joseph testified that he then tried to get Jimmy Fingers and Spooky to leave, but they started shooting. Spooky fired a shot at Anthony Baylor, and Jimmy Fingers turned and shot Merritt in the head. Joseph left, hearing more gunshots on the way out. Jimmy Fingers and Spooky followed with a 41 caliber revolver and a pumped shotgun taken from the apartment. The four men then returned to Bull's apartment, where Jimmy Fingers reported that everybody is dead. According to the medical examiner, Marco Baylor had seven gunshot wounds, Anthony Baylor had three gunshot wounds, and Anthony Merritt had two gunshot wounds. Meekins had been shot three times, but survived. Allegedly, Spooky referred to one of the victims as a female dog for crying prior to his murder. Spooky also allowed his girlfriend to wear a chain taken from one of the victims. Around this time, in and about late 1993 and early 1994, Spooky kept an Orinco SKS 7.62 caliber semi-automatic rifle, with a 30-round magazine, which he had altered by sawing off both the barrel and the stock. Christopher Harris and Corey Woody also sold crack for the Poison Clan in the Bellamy area of Richmond. In April 1994, Jose Hinton contacted Harris and arranged to meet him to pick up crack cocaine. Harris and Woody, however, planned to rob Hinton instead and enlisted the aid of Jimmy Fingers and Spooky. Unfortunately, the robbery attempt went awry, and Walter Twitty, who was not involved in the robbery attempt or the drug trade, was shot three times in the back and killed. Although ultimately convicted of participating in the conspiracy to rob Hinton and of various gun charges in connection with the incident, Jimmy Fingers and Spooky were acquitted of the murder charge associated with this incident. Now would be the best time to mention Scooter. Scooter was a well-known drug dealer and harbored the 90s section of Brooklyn. He was associated with other known dealers and was getting a lot of money. Scooter was Smiles' ally in the drug trude and eventually began overseeing the crew's drug operations in North and South Carolina. Scooter's responsibilities included procuring drugs for couriers to deliver to co-conspirators in the Carolinas, arranging meetings between couriers and local dealers, and, on at least one occasion, cooking powder cocaine into crack. In March 1994, Scooter traveled from New York to Columbia, South Carolina, where he remained long enough to set up a crack distribution operation on behalf of the Poison Clan. Smiles sent couriers to Columbia with cocaine, and Scooter sent them back to Smiles with cash. 
Smiles and Scooter referred to one another as partners and split the proceeds from the organization's Carolina drug operations equally between themselves. Other members of the organization testified that receiving a command from Scooter was tantamount to receiving a command from Smiles and that Scooter was Smiles' surrogate. In May 1995, members of the Poison Clan's Richmond contingent began to suspect that they were under government surveillance. Wary of the increased attention, Smiles and the man who oversaw the Richmond operations, Ricardo Laidlaw, closed up shop in Richmond. Laidlaw relocated to Brockton, Massachusetts, where he continued to distribute crack for the Poison Clan. In Brockton, the organization once again attracted the attention of the police, forcing Laidlaw to abandon that location and return to New York. The move provided little cover, however, for in New York the members of the Poison Clan found that federal agents were everywhere. Throughout the summer of 1996 Scooter and Laidlaw repeatedly warned Smiles that he was hot, and the three men began to discuss plans for going into hiding. Scooter had family in South Carolina, and he suggested that Smiles and Laidlaw could hide there without attracting the attention of the police. When Scooter's aunt died in late August 1996, he drove Smiles' Cadillac to St. Stephen, South Carolina, to attend the funeral. While there, he registered the car in the name of his cousin, Harold Scooter, and obtained South Carolina plates. Scooter and Laidlaw's fears that the police were closing in were well-founded. On June 7, 1996, a federal grand jury in the Eastern District of Virginia had returned a sealed indictment charging 23 members of the Poison Clan, including Smiles and Laidlaw, with conspiracy to distribute crack and powder cocaine. Additional charges against Smiles included two counts of murder. That same day, arrest warrants had also been issued, under seal, for all 23 defendants. Scooter was not indicted in this first round. Over the course of the summer of 1996, the FBI and the New York City Police Department located most of the indicted members of the Poison Clan. The FBI carried out a coordinated arrest plan in New Haven, New York, Richmond, and Fort Lauderdale on August 26, 1996. Although Smiles and Laidlaw were in New York on that day, they and a third member of the Poison Clan, Mark Phillips, successfully evaded arrest. The three decided that it was time to flee New York. Smiles called Scooter in South Carolina, informed him of the FBI's push to make arrests, and told him that they were heading south to meet him. Before leaving, however, Smiles obtained four kilograms of cocaine powder to supply the organization's North Carolina market. Art Sambrano drove Smiles, Laidlaw, and Phillips to Wilmington, North Carolina, where they met up with Scooter and yet another member of the ring, David Armstrong. In Wilmington, Smiles, Laidlaw, and Scooter discussed the fact that Smiles and Laidlaw were wanted by the authorities. Armstrong and Sambrano were excluded from these conversations, however, since they were not in the inner circle. After a few days in Wilmington, Smiles, Scooter, Laidlaw, Phillips, and Armstrong drove to St. Stephen's. They stayed there for the next few weeks at the home of Armstrong's parents, who were also cousins of Scooter. From St. Stephen's, Smiles arranged for a courier to deliver powder cocaine to Sambrano in Raleigh. When the drugs arrived, Smiles, Scooter, Laidlaw, Phillips, and Armstrong drove to Raleigh, where Armstrong had an apartment. Smiles, Scooter, and Laidlaw cooked the cocaine powder into crack and then turned it over to Sambrano for distribution. Scooter directed Laidlaw to tip Armstrong $200 for the use of his apartment, and Laidlaw did so. In early October 1996 Miles and Scooter decided to return to New York, where Smiles' fiancé still lived, and where Smiles planned to get a phony New Jersey driver's license with Scooter's help. While in New York, Smiles continued to send cocaine to Laidlaw in Raleigh. After about a month Smiles returned to Raleigh, while Scooter, who had been shot and wounded in the meantime, stayed behind in New York. Smiles was not gone for long, however, in late November he drove back to New York to buy an engagement ring for his fiance. A few days later, on November 26, 1996, Smiles was arrested in Oceanside, New York. Upon learning of Smiles' arrest, Scooter telephoned Laidlaw. Scooter urged Laidlaw to work with him to keep the operation going. Laidlaw and the other North Carolina members of the group continued selling the crack that they had on hand, periodically sending cash to Scooter in New York. In January 1997 Scooter persuaded Laidlaw, Phillips, and Sam Brano to send him $55,000 in cash for more crack that Scooter promised to ship. The money was sent, but Scooter never delivered the drugs. In August 1997 Laidlaw and Phillips were arrested in North Carolina. 
they cooperated with the authorities and provided information that led to Scooter's indictment and arrest in the spring of 1998. The indictment charged Scooter with one count of conspiracy to distribute crack cocaine, powder cocaine, and heroin, two counts of concealing a person from arrest, one count of money laundering, and one count of obstruction of justice for instructing a grand jury witness to lie. The jury convicted Scooter on the conspiracy count, both counts of concealing a person from arrest, and the one count of obstruction of justice. The district court sentenced Scooter to life in prison for the conspiracy conviction. Scooter also received concurrent sentences of 60 months for each of his two convictions for harboring and 120 months for obstruction of justice. The rest of the guys, the ones that didn't cooperate have life in prison and are still locked up. Those that did, got deals. But this about wraps it up for this one, and as always, stay low and thanks for watching.